So the question is that, uh, as a uh, as a police officer, I'm, a, I'm an inspector. Uh, I've uh, been in the uh, Metropolitan Police for 22 years. Uh, I'm a collision investigator for 17 of those 22 years. And, and collision investigation really is all about answering that question there. Uh, how did that happen? And I get asked that question by the coroner, um, the court, the barristers, the civil claim people, but most importantly, um, the families. Uh, the reality is that someone has gone out in the morning. They have gone to work, gone shopping, gone see friends, gone to school, and they've never come home. They have had a sudden, traumatic and violent death. And as a collision investigator, it's my job to find out why. To answer the question and to be their voice because someone has to say what happened, because they can't. And as a collision investigator, you have to go and meet the families and tell them the story and, and explain to them what's happened. As a um, police officer, I'm also a family liaison officer, so if I'm not dealing with the actual collision investigation, I also deal with the families. And the families are just suddenly thrown into this traumatic uh, series of events and, and we're with them for over a year. If, if it goes to Crown Court we are looking at over a year of these families thrown in at one end of this uh, machine and, and bewildering things happening and all the way through to various milestones to get them out to the other end. So what I want to do is just uh, talk about collision investigation and death and, and, and how we reconstruct things but also I want to explain what motivates me about collision investigation? I suppose, looking back on my life, I was almost sort of born to be a collision investigator. And I know that sounds a bit strange. Um, but in my past, I look back, and even from a young age, um, my father was a precision engineer, and he used to teach me about um, dealing with... Uh, Dealing with bits and pieces, uh, sorry, throw me a bit there. Uh, <laughs> I didn't think it was that bad. Um, <laughs> dealing with um, precision engineering, so looking at the more subtle things, and, and, and it, it stood me in good stead looking at the subtlety of, uh, of um, uh, mistakes, errors. Uh, when I go to scenes, I, I, you get this eye for seeing the, uh, the minute detail that's slightly off that gives us clues. Um, I suppose my first real foray into collision investigation or into road accidents um, was when I was 15. I was uh, coming out of the ABC cinema at uh, Stoneley on the Yule Bypass and uh, presented with a, a collision. Uh, two cars had been racing and um, it transpired that the vehicles had been souped up a bit. The, the lads were out uh, trying to uh, outdo each other. Uh, went through a red light struck a pedestrian and drove off. And like most people, I came out of the cinema and the police were there and the ambulance was there and there was a bit of a, uh, you look at it and go, oh, that looks terrible, go home. Monday morning, I go to school to find out that the person that had been killed um, was one of my school colleagues. Um, and I felt two, two emotions. I remember them quite vividly. First of all, I was a bit ashamed at the fact that I just looked at it with a bit of ambivalence. And, and secondly, real anger that someone could be crossing the road, same age as me, killed, and this person has gone off. And, and that anger got worse when I found out that when he, that they finally got this guy, uh, he got a fine and a driving ban. That was it. 15 years old, I was standing there, I remember thinking, is this the world that I'm going into, that you can actually kill people uh, with such ambivalence uh, and get away with it? Is, is this the society? And it, it rankled me for a while, and then a couple of years later, I managed to get knocked down by a bus. Um, so there we go. Um, I, I survived, thankfully, uh, clearly. Uh, <laughs> so um, there I am. Um, I wake up in hospital. Uh, I've had a splenectomy. Um, 
And uh, the last thing I remember is being um, halfway across the road, waiting to cross the other half, uh, and a bus suddenly swerving, coming towards me. But the reality is nothing happened. There I was in hospital, nearly killed, and yet again, nothing happened. And I decided, I vowed that I was going to do something about it. I was, that was it. I was going to do something definitely. Um, not too sure what, but I was definitely going to do something. Um, go off, join the police, and I come across um, collision investigation. I immediately felt at home. Maths, physics, technical drawing, um, everything that I really loved and, and investigation work all rolled into one and, and I really thought I was going to change the world and uh, sadly I haven't I'm afraid to tell you so uh, I think that reality dawns on, on most of us at some point in our lives that where we aim may not be where we end up but the thing that, that is so true is the complete ambivalence um, the, 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 the acceptance in society. Killing someone with a road vehicle is the most acceptable way of killing a fellow human being. Um, chaps, ladies, you know, if you really get fed up with your partner, it's a good way. <laughs> okay. If you walk out down the road and whack someone around the head with a lump of 4 by 2 obviously you've got anger issue, uh, management issues, uh, but you know, lot of, you know, people like myself turn up as police officers and we'll arrest you and you'll have a whole uh, squad of uh, detectives and you'll get 15, 20 years. Um, we run someone over, um, it's 14 years as long as you didn't mean to do it, as long as it was uh, an accident. Obviously, if, it, if you did it on purpose and we find out, then uh, you, you still get the murder or the manslaughter. So there is this just acceptance, and, and I'll prove it to you if I take you back to 2000. In the year 2000, um, this happened, the Hatfield train crash. Um, four people died, um, horrendous crash, and the railway network for two and a half years was paralysed while they resolved various issues. On that same day, eight people died on the roads of the UK. Also in 2000, Concorde. 109 souls lost when that plane crashed in France. Horrendous crash. That's two weeks road death in 2000 but nothing really significant happened about road death. And it's because it's just spread around the country. Lots of individuals. And in fact, you don't really get to hear about many of them. Uh, the reality is, um, if, you want, if, if you're in a, a fatal collision, um, you've got to have uh, three um, generations of the same family killed in the same crash. That, that generally gets it onto the papers. Um, or multiple uh, deaths or some celebrity involved. Uh, most people don't get a, a footnote. And that's just the sad fact, the truth uh, of it. And when I started looking at it, you, you go back to Bridget Driscoll, who was the first person that was uh, killed in a motor car um, in uh, 1896. She was killed at Crystal Palace. Um, even then, it really wasn't um, dealt with effectively. Bridget was taking her daughter May, who's standing next to her, um, to a dancing competition. And uh, she was uh, struck by a vehicle travelling at speed, um, zigzagging, racing another vehicle. And witnesses described it travelling at a tremendous speed, as fast as a galloping horse. One person described it as travelling as fast as a fire engine. Arthur Edsel, who was driving the vehicle, was doing four mile an hour. <laughs> okay. But he was a young lad, and um, obviously out to impress someone. And, and this is the, uh, uh, the vehicle that, that it was. Um, what he found was that it was belt driven. So being a clever lad, um, what he did is he, he realised that uh, you could change the belts that go onto the final chain drive, you could move them around and make it go twice as fast as, your, uh, as it was designed to. Uh, so he got his four mile an hour. Uh, and he was out impressing someone, racing another car, and I just suddenly thought, my God, you know, a hundred years later nearly, uh, my peer at school died 
in almost the same thing. 100 years, and what happened? Nothing. How, how as a society, as, uh, have we achieved nothing in resolving that sort of an issue? Went to the coroner. Lovely quote. <laughs> Let us hope such nonsense will never happen again. <laughs> Road death is now one of the largest killers in the world. Uh, I, I think that statement has to be up alongside uh, the, the guy who uh, refused to uh, sign up the Beatles. It, it sort of so missed the mark. I mean, as a society, we, we're doing reasonably well. If you have a look at the figures um, for us, it, it could have been so much worse. And, and that's really about uh, modern technology, airbags and um, side impact bars and, and, and better training of, of drivers. But it's still a lot of people that are, are, are killed every year. So what I want to do is just quickly run through some of the ways that we um, investigate collisions. And, and I want to tell you that we only get about two hours at a scene. Okay. So, uh, generally speaking, the one thing that people tell me all the time is, why does it take you so long? How long does it take you to take a few photos and drag a few cars out of the way? And, and I want to try and uh, get you to understand what we're doing and why it takes so long. The first thing I want to look at you is time marks. Uh, gorgeous time marks, aren't they? They're just lovely. Unfortunately, they are, they're a, 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 a breed that's, that's disappearing. Um, we don't get time marks very much because of anti-lock brake systems. Um, and as you can see, you've got a pair of time marks there, which ultimately are really four. So um, when you brake and skid your car, all the weight transfers to the front, and the front tyres become underinflated because of the weight that's on them. Uh, and the middle bit folds up and you, you run along the outside edge of the tyre. And likewise, on the rear, it goes quite wide and does an infill. But the thing I actually want to show you on this, there's nothing to do with that really, is this little blob here. This is a, a, a smear of a tyre, uh, a tyre mark. And that gives in mind the direction of travel. So if you think about the size of the average collision scene, it's about 50 to 100 metres. And we're looking for smear marks to try and determine the uh, direction of travel. In, in this one, we've got a little piece of stone has got stuck in the uh, tread of the uh, tyre. And it's caused a little scoring mark along the uh, road surface. Um, when we examine the vehicle at the scene, if we can find that stone in that tyre, then we can orientate the vehicle and put that uh, tyre back into the, uh, onto that mark. This is a, a collision where both people have been killed. There's no witnesses, and we've got two vehicles sitting across the road. It's down to the collision investigator to try and work out what happened. Now, one of them's been on the wrong side of the road, or both of them were straddling the road. You've got to search and find quite minute detail, subtle cuts and, and, and lumps out and gouges out of the road surface. In this one, we've used a thing called a momentum exchange where we've got the two vehicles of hit. And, and by using uh, basic maths, we can work out the speed of the vehicles. Likewise, on this, in the foreground, you've got this very weird tyre mark. And I, I don't apologise for some of these photos are a bit old. Uh, this is a striated tyre mark. And, and from that, the vehicle is actually at the limit of adhesion. So it's almost about to um, lose control. Uh, and it's actually describing a circle. And if you can get the radius of that circle, you can actually work out the speed of the vehicle at the start of that tyre mark. Um, but it's really difficult trying to draw a chord and a mid-ordinate. I don't know if you remember back in your maths doing the chord and mid-ordinate to work out radiuses. Um, well, this is how we do it. We use a, a laser beam and um, three um, uprights to, to, to create it. But if you can get the chord and the mid-ordinate, you can actually work out from, from that the radius of the circle and then from that the speed of the vehicle at the start of that time mark. Um, pedestrians. If a pedestrian gets hit and we know where they're struck and where they end up, we can actually mathematically work out the speed of the car. Likewise, we can work out the speed of the car where the pedestrian's head has hit the windscreen uh, and we know their height, then we can work out the speed of the car from that. 
We can work out the speed of the car from um, scratch marks, where the bit of this, on this case, there's a motorbike at the top corner um, where it slid down the road. If we can drag the bike along uh, and we can weigh how much uh, kilograms it takes to drag the bike along the road and then we weigh it, divide one by the other, we can get the coefficient of friction and again work out the speed of the vehicle. We can work out the speed of the vehicle from the, the amount of damage on the uh, metal. On this one we've got, uh, I don't know if you can see right in, on the tyre, there's an actual tyre imprint, uh, that's a cycle uh, tyre print where that's been uh, struck by this uh, lorry. Now if I go a closer shot, you can see the chain and the sprockets. What this enables us to do is that to orientate the cycle uh, so we can see which direction the cyclist was going and, and also work out the position of where the, the collision originally occurred. This earlier shot that I, I showed you, he's um, been crossing the road and he's been struck by a vehicle. Now the first thing that I noticed when I turned up at this scene is the uh, victim is behind the car. If the vehicle had been braking when it struck the pedestrian and continued to brake, he would have been in front of the vehicle or to one side. So immediately we know that um, the um, vehicle wasn't braking uh, when uh, the pedestrian was struck. And it's in, th in the lane three, which is important to us later on. And you can see the damage uh, on the front near side corner and we can see that the windscreen has been delaminated to an extent that I can tell you that that doesn't really occur under about 50 mile an hour. Using the same technique as you use to develop fingerprints, we have um, developed what we call the white mark. So this shows the progression of the victim as they've gone up the, uh, uh, up the bonnet of the vehicle. And ultimately, they've ended up on the rear offside corner of this vehicle. So they've started out on the front near side, the passenger side, and they've ended up on the rear driver off side. What that tells us is this victim, as they were in the road, they were walking from left to right. Had they been stationary, they would have gone straight over the vehicle. Um, but they've actually gone at an angle. So he's been walking across the road, and actually it transpires that he's cleared two lanes of traffic, and he's just stepping into third when this vehicle um, has approached the red light and struck him. And this is why it takes us so long, because I want to look at, uh, look at this. What you're looking at is a filament of a light bulb. And please look at the um, scale there, what one millimetre looks like. Okay? The piece at the scene is literally just over a millimetre of filament. And we have had to search this, uh, this whole round, this uh, whole collision scene, and we've got to photograph it, and we've got to look at for all the evidence and recover it. And we found that piece of filament, and we found the vehicle, and the driver denied being involved. But we've taken the filament with, from the broken bulb that's on the vehicle, and the, what you can see on the bottom is the two ends of the filament under a microscope being matched up to show that they are the same. The striation marks go across the joint. That was one piece of wire up until the point it broke. That's the piece of evidence that convicted this person. A millimetre's worth of filament. And that's our difficulty. It's very small things in a very big area that we have to recover. And we only get about two hours at most to clear the scene. Tire marks are disappearing, CCTV is uh, appearing, and, and just very quickly, the, um, this is a plan view, so this is generated from a laser scanner, so we used to use a theodolite to survey it. We've now got these laser scanners that pick up 157,000 points a second. Very um, amazing um, clouds, we have like a 3D world. We can almost take our crime scene <coughs> away with us now. And we, we've uh, marked out very accurately a, a series of lines because we know the distance. And we've got CCTV of this collision. Um, we use a thing called a light board where we calibrate the CCTV so we know the uh, frame rate of the CCTV and we know the distance the vehicle is travelling. 
and if we've got time and distance, we can work out speed. Very simple maths. So we can actually work out the speed from each frame and we can actually work out the acceleration rate of this vehicle as he strikes the uh, pedestrian there. And actually what we can do is then look at the acceleration rates of the vehicle and find that this person has literally got their foot to the floor uh, as they accelerate towards this person and knock them down. So it goes back to that question, how did it happen? As a collision investigator, it's your job to try and work it out using the evidence we find at the scene. Sometimes incredibly small, tiny bits of evidence that we need to collate. And I know that when you're going home and the road's closed and you're going to be delayed getting home, it's annoying. But you're going to go home. And I wish that people weren't going to die on the roads, but they are. And the phone's going to ring and we're going to go out and with all the equipment that we've got, with our best ability, we're going to recover that information. And what I need from you is two hours to try and get that information. Because we have to answer that question. We have to tell the families what happened. And because they're a person and they deserve their story to be told. Thank you.